Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome to Scripture and Tradition, a program where we bring you some ways to approach the Bible, to understand it better, to know what it says, and then how to approach it. And that's what we're doing. Like last week, if you recall, I mentioned the importance of meditating on the Gospels. And I talked about one method of praying is a discursive type of prayer in which you First of all, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. It's always essential. Secondly, you picture the scenes of the gospel. And then after you have a strong imagination in your mind, how things might look and sound, even smell, uh, then you enter into the gospel story itself and meditate upon that passage. And putting yourself into the scene, if you can, that's one way to do it. Make yourself one of the characters. What would it be like to be the person, so on. And then after you've gone through that time of meditating on the gospel, then, or it can be Old Testament too, but one of the stories that goes on, then you enter into three colloquies. Now, colloquy is a little discussion, and you first of all have a colloquy with uh, our, our lady. First of all, approach her. And talk to like a friend to a friend, as St. Ignatius of Loyola says, and discuss what it was like, and just have that conversation, and with a Hail Mary, and then go to Christ. And do the same, have a conversation with Christ about the prayer, and then after you've done that, do the uh, prayer, Sola Christ. And then finally, have a conversation with the Father. And again, talk to him. What would it be like to discuss that scene with the Father and then conclude with our Father? And again, we always remember, we start off with the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who guides our prayer because St. Paul says we don't know how to pray as we ought, and the Holy Spirit points us to our Lord Jesus and to the Father. So we don't neglect Him, but we instead let Him be the one pointing us toward God and doing so through the Gospel. Now, we've been dealing with this issue of sin, and we would very much like to deal with a, a couple more episodes that deal with the question of sin. Last week we mentioned the call of St. Matthew the tax collector from Mark chapter 2. Today we'd like to deal with another tax collector, Zacchaeus. This is an episode found in Luke 19 verses 1 through 10. And um, remember what I said about uh, tax collectors. They were so despicable in the uh, Jewish society that the rabbis made it a rule that you may not even allow any of your relatives to marry a tax collector. You don't even want them in your family. That's how despicable they were considered because they were not just raising taxes, but they were working for the Romans and they were given a certain amount of tax they had to collect, anything above that they got to keep. So this, you know, being from a city like Chicago myself, one starts to suspect that there could be a scam involved every so often with some of these people. And so here we have Zacchaeus. He's at the city of Jericho. Jericho is, um, you know, down in the Jordan Valley. It's the lowest city on the surface of the earth. And this is a, a place that was also a very important uh, intersection of the ancient road system, and still is, still is. You know, I go through Jericho all the time. When you come from the north, if you come from the south, you come from the west, you go, uh, or, or from the east. The, the, the roads that connect uh, the 
uh, south with the Dead Sea in the area south of there, some cities. Also with uh, Amman. Amman is, if you're driving straight through without a border control, it's only a 45-minute ride from Jericho to Amman. And maybe 30 minutes to Jerusalem. You get an idea of the close. And there was a very important palace for King Herod the Great that was built there. A great big pool. In fact, I believe it was there that Herod the Great drowned his brother-in-law, who was the high priest. Um, one of Herod's many crimes. And so this was a place where as these roads intersected between great cities like Amman, which was called in those days Philadelphia, and Jerusalem and other areas of the country, there was a lot of money to be made by somebody collecting taxes at those intersections. You know how it is with a toll booth. Imagine the guys at the toll booth on the interstate are told, uh, you have to give me $100,000 a year. Anything beyond that, uh, you get to keep. That's Zacchaeus. That's the kind of deal he's got. So we see that there was a man, in verse 2, a man was there at Jericho named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. So he also had other people working for him, and he got to skim off the top from what they skimmed off the top. Again, it reminds me of home. And so, so this is something that is very important. Now, notice this, and this is what you try to do. Imagine yourself being that kind of rich guy who's made all this money by collecting the taxes from everybody else, who are a lot poorer than you are. And then he is at this place, and he hears that Jesus is coming through Jericho. Okay. Now, we see, the, put yourself in his shoes, he, that he was trying to see who Jesus was. But on the count of the crowd, he could not because he was short. He was short in stature, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. Now, the sycamore tree, I, I wish I had a picture of it. There's a very old sycamore tree that's still in Jericho, and all the pilgrims go there to take a look at it. And you can see exactly why Zacchaeus would go into a sycamore tree, because the sycamore is a tall tree, very thick trunk, and the branches come from the trunk, and they go perpendicular to the trunk. So it would be easy to get up there and then sit on a branch that is perpendicular to the trunk. Acts like a good seat, right? So that's something, again, try to picture that. But then, and also the sycamore has a fruit. That's why they have those over there. There's a kind of fruit that's sort of like a fig uh, that they go and, and they eat that still. So, so, one of the things to think about is Zacchaeus is the one who took the initiative to go and get that place. He wanted to sit on that tree. Nobody told him to do that. He did that on his own. And this is how much he wanted to see Jesus. Now, again, imagine yourself doing that. But think about so many other areas. How much do we really want to see God? How much do we want to know who Christ is? How curious are we? And what steps do we take? And we have to think about what would be my equivalent in my life of climbing into the branch of the sycamore tree. We also might want to take a look at in what ways is my sinfulness like that of Zacchaeus? How have I taken advantage of other people the way Zacchaeus was doing? These are some of the things for us to begin to reflect on. Now, 
when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. Now, think about that too. Here's somebody who took that initiative, was eager to go and see Jesus. <coughs> and Jesus now shows an eagerness to spend time with him. You have to pay attention to what, what I said before about how disliked the tax collectors were for their collaboration with the Romans and for taking money from the people. That's why the reaction to Jesus' words comes right away. People react in verse 7. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of some, someone who is a sinner. Well, now there are a couple problems with that. First of all, everybody saying that was one of the sinners. Now, Zacchaeus' sin was very public. And everybody knew because they were paying him the taxes. And they didn't want to let their relatives even marry him. And they excluded him. And here's another side of that. Keep in mind how in the Talmud, especially, you, which is a collection of the sayings of rabbis, who most of whom lived between uh, 200 A.D. and 450 A.D., and these rabbis have all these sayings about various issues of how you live a life of moral purity. And one of the issues that comes up among the rabbis is table fellowship with the rabbi. This was a very high privilege, especially on Friday night. Friday is the Sabbath, begins at sundown, right? And there is a synagogue service. And then after the synagogue service, there's a meal. And sharing that meal with the rabbi and his disciples is a very important process. This, as a matter of fact, uh, when I was studying uh, uh, early rabbinic Judaism, we spent a significant amount of time studying some of those passages in the Talmud discussing table fellowship. And it's very important in the mind of, of Jews. Um, there, I, I forget the name of the movie, but you see how in one movie where the rabbi is eating and his disciples all around, they're uh, Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish people in New York, in Brooklyn. And when the rabbi finishes eating and gets up, his disciples grab at the crumbs. Ah, it's called The Chosen. That's it, The Chosen. And in the, the, this movie, The Chosen, you see how they go after the crumbs. And he describes it even more so in the book, which I read many years ago. And the idea is that those who take the crumbs from the rabbi's bread get to receive some of the grace of God by doing that. That's part of what's going on. And this idea of uh, having um, a certain amount of uh, fellowship with the rabbi by go eating the crumbs off his table, this is very important in Jewish mentality. And so that's why everybody is so scandalized. And again, you're going to, you're a rabbi and you might let him eat some of the food with you and you need at his table. Do you know that his place is probably not even kosher? Maybe I'll be right. You know, it wouldn't have been, and so this is scandalous. But again, in verse 8, 
we see that Zacchaeus takes the initiative again. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. Wow. Remember, he's a very rich man. So he's going to give half away to the poor. And then he still has another half, right? If I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Now, he obviously knows the book of Deuteronomy, the law, because it's in Deuteronomy that if you steal something, you must pay it back four times as much. Also in Exodus 22, verse 1, when someone steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters or or sells it, the thief shall pay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. The thief shall make restitution, but if unable to do so, shall he shall be sold for the theft into slavery. Now, this brings out a very important point, and Zacchaeus does. Restitution for our sins is very important, and that this is part of reconciliation that he does restitution. And he's, but he also shows, first of all, generosity to the poor. He now has an empathy for all the poor people from whom he had been taking those taxes. And he realizes I have to give it back. All the people I've cheated, so I'm going to pay them back four times as much. I'm going to obey the law. He's also implying with that a, a recognition of his own guilt. He recognizes, I am guilty of theft. And therefore, therefore, I must pay this back. And this is something where all of us can then enter into the text, enter into the mindset of Zacchaeus, and do as he did, which is to admit our own guilt for what we have chosen to do wrong. You don't blame your parents. You don't blame society. You don't blame poverty. Nothing. You blame yourself. In other words, instead of not just blame yourself, you accept your responsibility for committing these sins. And that's why in verse 9, Jesus responds, and said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. He was a son of Abraham by birth. He's Jewish. So all people from the people of Israel are that. And this is, you know, what uh, that is by nature, you know, physical nature, a son of Abraham. But Christ declares salvation has come to this house because he is the son of Abraham. Abraham was seen in rabbinic Judaism as the person through whom God bestowed all of his grace. And therefore, you had to belong to Abraham. Even if you were a convert to Judaism, you needed to have this relationship with Abraham, and they would wait a couple of generations. And as a result, we see that um, Jesus uh, also says, for the Son of Man came to save those who were lost. We, he said that about Matthew, the tax collector. Now he says that about Zacchaeus. And he wants us to understand none of us are outside the realm of salvation. None of us are hopeless cases that can't be saved. And all of us need to take responsibility for our sins and use this passage as a way, not just to say that as an idea, but getting in your imagination, prayerfully become Zacchaeus and realize what you have next. So we're going to take a little break now, but I want to remind you that the next book we'll be taking when we finish this, we have just this chapter and the next chapter after it, um, the next book we're going to 
take is called SAVE, the Bible study for Catholics. So I want to get ahead of that and go to religiouscatalog.com. That's uh, ewtnrc.com. And you can get that book as well. We'll be going through what it means to be saved. Uh, this is just one passage, but there are plenty more. All right, we are going to take a break and we'll come back and talk about the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears. And we'll explain why I have this jar. So please stay with us. Thank you and welcome back. Um, we went through this material about Zacchaeus. I want to stay in the Gospel of St. Luke. Uh, St. Luke is sometimes identified as the evangelist of mercy. He has lots and lots of episodes about forgiveness of sin. He's also the Gospel writer who includes more stories about women than any of the other evangelists. And we're going to go to a passage that combines his uh, concern for women as well as his love for mercy. This is in Luke 7, beginning uh, with verse uh, 36, when uh, Jesus goes to um, a town and he is invited to the Sabbath meal at the house of a rabbi named Simon. And we see there, uh, and, and again, this was something I mentioned in the last episode. Simon the rabbi invited him to this table fellowship. And in so doing, he was honoring Jesus by letting him into this table fellowship with him. But the problem starts, as a matter of fact, we can even call, call this the fly in the ointment, because it says in verse 37, And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment, and she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears, and to dry them with her hair. And she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now, this is an alabaster jar. I got this uh, uh, at an alabaster factory. <laughs> In, uh, actually, uh, it's a solid alabaster. And that's the kind of jar that she would have had. I don't know if hers was larger or smaller. But it would be uh, look something like this. You can see it's kind of a translucent stone. And the way they make such jars is they drill into this. Now imagine, they did not have modern drills. They had drills, but they were done by hand. And they had to go into it. Now it's not a super hard stone, but it's hard enough. And they have to go all the way into there. I, I can't get my fingers to the bottom, but you would put perfume in this or other precious things. It's not like uh, a clay jar. Uh, clay jars were very inexpensive. Alabaster is prettier. See all the different colors, stone and stuff. Um, so that's what she had. And she would have had that perfumed ointment as part of her profession. She was a professional lady. Uh, when it says that she was uh, a sinner uh, in the town, she was, uh, it means everybody knew what she did, which was prostitution. And she would be distinguished from other women frequently enough because the women who were married would wear a veil. 
she, on the other hand, might not. And she would also have a number of men coming to her house, some of whom may well have been at the dinner. You know, that's something that's not new, that even religious people sometimes commit these kinds of sins of the flesh. And so um, this is something that he, she, she comes into. Now, A, having a sinner at the rabbi's meal is really scandalous. Secondly, having a woman there. Women did not sit with the men. They sat with the women. I have still, I've experienced that still in modern times at the homes of a number of my Arab friends, especially Muslims. They are more so than Christian. Christians, women and men sit together at table. That's, that's pretty common. But at the home of most of the Muslims I, I've been to, and I've been invited to their homes, uh, only once did the wives ever sit because, in fact, some of the men were Christians. They brought their wives with them. And so then the Muslim women also sat at the table. There were other women, so it was okay. But when it's just the, the guys invited, the lady of the house will not sit with us. And that's just the way that it is. Uh, as a matter of fact, the sons, do the serving. And there's a concern that you may inadvertently look askance at another man's wife, and that's an insult that can cause a lot of trouble. So that's why they don't have women at the table. That kind of cultural mentality was here too. So when she just boldly comes in, uh, and again, she's accustomed to the company of men, into negotiating business with them. But here, she's not doing either. She's repenting. And she does so by crying tears of repentance. Now, imagine, imagine what it's like to cry tears of repentance. That means, A, you did something wrong. B, you accept the fact that it was wrong. See, you begin to see this caused great insult to God and harm to others. She'd been helping men to cheat on their wives. It's a lot of damage. And these points help her realize the need for repentance. Now, with that, she also takes the ointment that she has in this very precious jar. So the ointment would have been expensive. You would never put that quality of ointment into a regular clay jar. You keep it in something like alabaster. That's really special. Just like to even today, uh, ladies' perfume. I remember my mother had some perfumes, and it would be in these very fancy little jars. I thought they were they're so pretty and so cool. I, like the smells always, but you know, that's, um, that's what you do with precious perfumes. So also did they do. And she just takes and pours it on his feet. Usually a jar, I remember my mother would have a perfume and a jar of perfume could last I don't know, a long time because she only put a drop or two here and there, right? But this, she takes this precious ointment and just pours it. There's this certain realization that this one is a way, that this Jesus is the one who can bring me reconciliation. And that's a great step. Now, the next part of that, after she shows this great repentance, and oh, and wipes his feet with her, with her hair. Then we see in verse 39, Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Now, this is a very important. Remember from last week, I mentioned how the Pharisees had a theory that the Messiah cannot come so long as there's even a single sinner around. They believed that if every Jew would obey 
all the laws of God for a half hour, then the Messiah would come. That was his window of opportunity. Here, this guy claims to be a prophet, and he's letting a sinner touch him. But think about, so think about his implication that that can't happen, or shouldn't happen. And then our Lord wants us to think about his own understanding of it. So again, put yourself into this mindset. And he's, Christ is trying to get Simon the Pharisee to think about this in verse 41 to 43, when he tells a little parable. He says, a certain creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii, which is a silver coin that you use for uh, feed yourself for a day. The other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Notice how our Lord ends with a question. Why? Why does he ask that? because he wants Simon to think about it. And that's what he's also asking us to do. Imagine if, you know, you, you owed a debt of, you know, $5,000 or $500,000 or something big. And then you also owed a debt of $100. And which, uh, if you get forgiven, both that, uh, or two guys get forgiven, and one guy a hundred bucks. Oh, thanks, that's really nice of you. But someone who's five thousand dollars, that's really big. And so Simon answers it the correct, the correct way. He says, I suppose the one whom he canceled the greater debt. So that's the principle. The greater the debt that gets forgiven, the greater the gratitude. And Jesus said, you, You've judged rightly. That's right. It's that's the bigger issue. So from that point, our Lord wants us very much to uh, consider how we look upon other sinners, for one thing, that we have, um, you know, those people that uh, sinned, uh, you know, greatly. And we, we know them. There are a lot of public sinners around. We're seeing them oftentimes paraded in the media. Sometimes they put themselves up for there because there's a principle in the secular world that no uh, um, uh, news is, is bad news, in other, or, or no publicity is bad publicity. Um, you know, that you, um, anything even if it's bad about you, you can be used to promote your career. So we have a lot of people promoting all kinds of sin. We know big sinners. And we know some people who do tremendous evil, not just the kind of sins they tout in some of the gossip magazines, but people who commit horrendous murders and all sorts of terrible things. And this is something where we begin to see the application of what our Lord said in Matthew 6. We've already looked at this. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Matthew 6, verse 12. And this idea of forgiving our debtors is partly behind this very same uh, image, as well as the parable of the unforgiving servant that we already looked at in Matthew 18, looked at a couple times. So it's at that point of recognizing that Simon the Pharisee gave a good answer. By the way, I don't know if you knew this, but Simon was the most commonly name, commonly used name among Jews in the first century. A little bit of trivia that you may not have learned, and I was doing some research and discovered that myself. But anyway, I digress. Turning toward the woman, Jesus said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, which would be dusty. But she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And you gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. And you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Now notice, Jesus doesn't say, oh, she didn't, it's not that big a deal, you know. Her sins are just sex, so it's not a big deal. No, 
Her sins were many. He recognizes that. But she has shown, shown this great love because she has had much forgiven. That's why he gives the principle. The one to whom little is forgiven loves little. But she's forgiven because she loves much. And this is very important. This is one of the reasons why I think it's worth bringing up. You know, so I know some of the churches teach you're justified by faith alone. My problem with that is that that is not a scriptural point of view. The Bible never says that you're justified by faith alone. That was an idea that Martin Luther derived from the Bible. And then when he translated the Bible, he added the word alone to faith. You know, by, by Glauben alleine, uh, by faith alone. He added the word alleine, alone. And he also added, nur by Glauben, only by faith. Are you justified? He added the word only. It's, yes, you are justified by faith. Don't take that away either. That's the other extreme. You don't, you don't get saved by your own efforts. It's not your own works. But neither is it by faith alone. Here we see an example where it's the love that this woman shows that evokes from Jesus this phrase that you, you're forgiven, you're saved. That's important about the role of her love. It also fits very much what's going on in uh, Matthew 25, verse 31 and following. When I was hungry and thirsty and naked in prison and sick, you helped me. And that's why you're saved. You show you love. So love is important. And <coughs> then it's at that point in verse um, 48 that Jesus causes the next level of scandal. Your sins are forgiven. Whoa, 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 whoa. Remember we saw this last week when we talked about the paralytic who was let down through the roof and Jesus forgave his sins. The Pharisees objected. Well, they do it again here too in verse 49. Who is this? Who even forgives sins? The rabbinic principle is that only God can forgive sins. That's what we saw back in Mark chapter 2. You know, when, when uh, the, the rabbi said, why does this fellow speak in this way? Mark 2, 7. It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Okay, we'll go with that. We'll accept that. Only God alone can forgive sins. But as these people say that, those of us who know the gospel also know that Christ is God. And this is where he then says in verse 50, the very next verse, he turns again to the woman, doesn't answer their question. They're not ready for that. But he turns to the woman in verse 15 and says, your faith has saved you, go in peace. So here we see, Faith does save. And we need to have faith. That's a kind of trust that we are supposed to have. So remember what I just said. I didn't say that you are not justified by faith. You are justified by faith. It's just not by faith alone. It's her love and her faith. This is you know, uh, what the scripture teaches and that we have to have a very good sense of this. So that we see, for instance, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Once again, St. Paul himself never says that you're justified by faith alone. It's rather that it is faith working itself out through love. And it's a, it's a middle voice uh, verb. This was faith working itself out for love. And that's why it also says in chapter uh, Galatians 5, verse 5, for through the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Oh, now we got all three, faith, hope, and love. These are the three theological virtues 
In other words, they are given to us as grace. So we have a grace of being able to hope for salvation, that, uh, and, and hope for righteousness. The, our Lord doesn't say, I'm already saved, or you are already saved, you are already justified, therefore no work about it, don't worry about it. No, he gives us hope for ultimate righteousness. There's righteousness now, but there's also the ultimate righteousness by which we enter into heaven, and our faith is working itself out with love. And that's right there in St. Paul, Galatians 5, verses 5 and 6. And this is something very important for us to keep in mind. And we ought to put ourselves into understanding this better by seeing the woman showed love, and that love was a working out of her faith, and that they went together as St. Paul teaches. All right. We're going to take another break. We'll come back. I just want to give a couple other little comments about uh, this passage and how to think about praying over it, and we'll get some questions. So please stay with us. just want to remind you a few ways to, again, approach this passage in your own prayer. Think about this. And you have to examine your own conscience on this. I don't know you, and I don't know where you fit, but maybe all of us fit in different places. Remember I said, use your imagination to picture the scene. Even try to imagine what the perfume might smell like. I was going to bring some of the, uh, the, the, the now that I've got some at home, but, uh, you know, I got also in Egypt. Uh, but, you know, I, I didn't bring that with because you can't smell it anyway. <laughs> this is television, not smell vision And so, uh, but one of the things, when you do imagine what that smells like, what the scene would be like, how people are, you know, at the, at the table, probably laying down, as most of they lay down on couches or pillows. Then also ask yourself, do you see yourself as being like the woman? Or do you see yourself as being like some of the guests at table? Now, there a lot of us might be, especially the ones who go to church and are good Catholics, we might sometimes see ourselves as being like the self-righteous guests. If that's the case, enter into that and let Jesus confront you as such. If you are a major sinner like this woman, then be her. Imagine you, you know, where that applies to you in your life and ask, let our Lord confront you that way. And think about you know, what it would take to weep over your sins and give away your, your stuff like Zacchaeus did, or this woman giving away her precious ointment. Think also about that connection between her great generosity and her humility of kissing his feet and washing his feet with her tears and hair, getting the dirt from the road all over her hair. So she probably took good care of. Think about what forgiveness is like. The times when you've been forgiven for the things that you found most difficult to confess. Get into that and put yourself into that scene and apply this passage to yourself and see if that helps us to get into a deeper understanding of repentance. 
All right, what I'd like to do is take a look at some questions. First of all, I have a gentleman here in the studio. It's nice seated, that's better, yeah, yeah. Uh, where are you from? Uh, good afternoon, Father. I'm from uh, uh, Southwest Florida, Great. originally from New York, but and down there being retired is a wonderful thing. So. There you go, there you go. <laughs> and your question? My question is, quite often in the scriptures, Jesus has been referred to or called rabbi. And my question is, is that at those times, how and how did a Jewish person qualify to become mm -hmm. a rabbi? Mm -hmm. Was it in the family? Did they go to school? Did they mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. something like that? Because nothing I've ever come across that is ever yeah. referred to how that's done. If you notice in the Gospels, it mentions sometimes the scribes and the Pharisees. Ever see that? Yes. The scribes were the more highly educated Pharisees. That was the scholar. Among, and then lawyers also. Uh, St. Luke especially, you see the mention of lawyers as well as scribes and Pharisees. These are different roles within the Pharisee party. And rabbis were an institution of the Pharisee party. Sadducees had the priesthood. And the, ra the Pharisees were a lay movement. There might have been, there were certainly some priests involved, but primarily the Pharisee party was a lay movement. And uh, because the priests had become quite corrupt. And so the lay people decided that they would study scripture more. And you would have at the synagogues teaching children how to read the Bible. Christ obviously knew how to do that. He read the, the text of scripture in Luke chapter 4. Uh, so he knew how to read and write, probably the other boys in his village. But if you became gifted, you'd be somewhat recognized, like we still do with students. Oh, you should go on and study more. Uh, or told, uh, you really should get a job as a laborer. I think it's time to go back to the farm <laughs> or the, to the shop or whatever you work. Um, that would be going on. And for those who did have more of a, uh, a, a scholarship uh, quality, then they would go more and more deeply. And there are even esoteric texts that they would study um, that they got more deeply into uh, as, as scribes and, and lawyers. Uh, and they would uh, memorize large sections of the Bible. And the rabbis still do that. They memorize uh, you know, the whole Mishnah and the whole of uh, the Torah. They'll memorize every word of it in Hebrew as well as in the native language. So uh, oftentimes they'll memorize the Torah among some of them before they're uh, six, seven years old, even five years old. So kids have great capacity for memory, and that's why you teach small children to memorize, because they can memorize. But one of the things that uh, then there'd be general recognition, but it kind of a popular, later on there was a ceremony, but in the early days of scene, we, we don't know much about any ceremony. Uh, later on we do see that. Okay. Well, that would be kind of the process. And we have an email from Joanne. Dear Father Paco, I've been watching your shows about sin, and I wonder if we're always supposed to feel like we're in sin or one step away from damnation, even if we try to do our best by going to confession and mass. How can we find the freedom to not have guilt? Joanne in Virginia. Joanne, <clears throat> there are a couple things. St. Paul distinguishes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I urge you to read that passage. He talks about guilt that is good for us, guilt that leads, moves us towards salvation. And that is the guilt when we have actually committed something wrong, we realize it was wrong, we realize the effects of it, and like the woman, uh, or like Zacchaeus, they do something about it. They repent. And they make a change in their life because of that guilt. And they overcome it. There's another kind of guilt that is an emotional guilt. And that, St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, is not healthy towards salvation. So we ought not to wallow in feelings of guilt by any means. That's not something great for us. 
Um, but we ought instead to face the guilt for what we've actually done, which was wrong, confess it, and then hand it over to Christ and do what we can to help overcome it, okay? That's, you know, make appropriate changes in our lives. But I don't think there's, I, I don't feel, feel I'm just one step away from damnation. Could be, you know, I mean, there's plenty of sins that you can do to get right over that threshold and get right into damnation. Plenty of that. A lot of people do that. A lot of that going on, a lot of violence, sexual misuse, and all that kind of stuff. But we should be focusing not on fear of the sin, but on fear of the Lord. That helps us to become wise. Remember, that's what the Scripture says. For the, the wisdom, uh, the, our fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's what we should do, is seek wisdom. All right, let's now go over to uh, another email from Kim uh, from Facebook. Uh, in order to provide a means of salvation for humanity, Jesus had to suffer and die. I wonder about Judas' act of betrayal. What he did was a sin, but in a way it was necessary, yes? Jesus said it would have been better had Judas never been born because of his sin. But wasn't Judas and his betrayal necessary? Wouldn't God therefore cut him some slack and forgive him for his necessary act? Thank you again, Father Mitch, for a great Bible study. Kim, God would definitely cut him slack for his betrayal if he asked for it. But Judas despaired and he went and committed suicide and precluded himself from you know, uh, finding reconciliation. So, the, and that's the difference between him and Peter. Peter denied Jesus, to be sure. But it is Peter who then goes and repents. He weeps tears so that there were, uh, the tradition says there were furrows in his face. And at the church of St. Peter and Gallican II, which is the church of St. Peter uh, the, where the cock crowed, is built over the house of Caiaphas the high priest. And in there, there's this, uh, there's a set of three icons. One has Jesus looking right at Peter as Peter denies him. And that causes Peter to be shocked, to remember Jesus had predicted the denials. Then the next picture is Peter is weeping in a cave. And already he has a halo around him. In the first picture, there's no halo. He's sinning. Second one, there's a halo as he repents. And in the third one, there's also a halo when Jesus reconciles him. Jesus wanted, would have been happy to reconcile Judas but Judas wasn't capable. So, you know, he could have been forgiven. God would have done it, but he chose against it. All right. The Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by his peace. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring you this program and all of our programs only because the network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And we will be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you and thank you.